All right, guys, so today's lesson is on uh, medicine and law, and please stick with me through this one. It is going to be a long presentation. We're probably looking at about 40 minutes on this one, as there's 43 slides. There's a ton on it. Um, so the first couple lectures that you guys have watched has really been about you as a student and you as a professional. Now we're really getting into the logistics of medical assisting and, and the administrative aspect um, subject in that. Um, so today's learning objectives, we're going to be able to define, spell, pronounce, and um, the terms listed in the vocab, and we're really going to get into those this time. We're going to compare criminal and civil laws they apply to practicing medical assistance, and also discuss contract laws. Um, summarize the anatomy of a medical professional liability lawsuit, and explain the four essential elements um, of a valid contract, and then we'll discuss the various parts of a medical uh, professional liability lawsuit. We'll also discuss the advantages of mediation and arbitration, and you'll need to be able to do the following related to medical liability and negligence, and you need to differentiate between malfeasance, misfeasance, and nonfeasance. Know the four Ds of de uh, negligence and define the types, different types of damages. Um, you also have to discuss risk management and describe liability, malpractice, uh, and personal injury insurances, including the importance of informed consent. And then define the statutes of limitation and confidentiality. And then finally, uh, discuss compliance reporting and self, uh, patient self-determination act, the and, and a lot of the main laws that come through uh, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act and the Patient Bill of Rights. Um, describe the important issues of the ADAA and the GINA Acts, and then explain components of HIPAA, identify high tech acts and, and its impact on ele electronic transmission to its patients, and then summarize the primary features of the Affordable Care Act. So, as I said, guys, it's a ton here. We're going to go over a lot of stuff that is really important. And guys, this is the fourth section on your certified medical administrative exam. So this is really the first time you're getting information that is going to be, you will be tested on um, on, your certified uh, on your certified medical administrative assistant exam. So really pay attention, really take your time with understanding this stuff. So the first couple of things is gonna be a lot of vocab here. So jurisprudence and, and the classifications of law. So jurisprudence, okay? And, and jurisprudence comes from the Latin words juris, which means laws, right, equity, and justice, and then prudentia, which means skill or good judgment. So you kind of put that together and it kind of means the science of philosophy and law. Um, so an act is something that is passed by Congress, okay? It becomes a national law, um, where a statute is enacted by state legislature. So that's a state law. And then ordinance is created and enacted by a local government, like a city or a town. And then a precedent is something that is set forth by a jury. Okay, so the U.S. Constitution, Constitution takes precedence over federal statutes, court opinions, and state constitutions. The state constitution is a supreme law within the boundaries of each state unless it conflicts with that U.S. Constitution. So often, judges and juries, once we get down here to the last one, follow precedence when making decisions on court cases. So if there was a situation where a court decision was made, they will look back onto that in future cases down the road. So there's basically two main cases or, or, or categories of jurisprudence, and there's criminal law and then that's civil law. So we'll get into that a little bit here. So criminal law, so the medical administrative assistant needs to understand the difference between the types of law and how it affects their practice um, in the physician's medical office. Okay, so criminal law, law uh, governs violations punishable as offenses against the state or the government. Okay, while civil law is concerned with acts that are not criminal but involve relationships between individuals and other individuals, groups, or government agencies. So the medical assistant must personally review these laws and, uh, that influence the medical assistant practice and make sure that they are followed on a const constant basis with documentation to prove necessary if you are taken to court. So let's get in a little bit more into criminal law. So criminal, criminal law are punishable as offenses and as we said, it's either against the state or against the federal government. So a federal offense is, involves the welfare and the safety of the public as a whole rather than that of an individual. So that's, that's where you're looking against the federal government, okay? Um, misdemeanors are minor crimes, okay? Um, while felonies are a little bit uh, bigger up and they're more important, or more, not more important, sorry, more substantial. So the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony so a person who commits a felony is imprisoned for more than one year, whereas those who commit a misdemeanor are imprisoned for less than one year. So that's a little important fact. And then of course, treason. So due process. When we're talking about criminal law, we, we gotta talk about due process. And due process guarantees that the accused will have an opportunity to defend themselves against any charges brought in opposition. So it gives you the, the 
uh, ability to defend yourself in court, uh, it, for anything that, that is being said about you. And then we have civil law, okay? So civil law, civil law is not criminal in nature. It can be against individuals, organizations, or government agencies. So the type of civil law that directly affects the medical profession is, um, well, there's a couple of them. The three that most directly do it are, or affect the medical profession include tort law, contract law, and administrative law. So we'll get into a little bit um, more of this in a little bit here. So tort law, there's four main elements that have to be established. So in tort law, the plaintiff must, number one, establish that the respondent or defendant was under the legal duty to act in a particular fashion. Number two, demonstrate that the defendant breached that duty by failing to conform his or her behavior accordingly. Number three, prove that the breach of, uh, prove that the breach of legal duty approximately caused some injury or damage. And then number four, prove those damages. So medical professional liability or medical malpractice falls under this tort law. Um, so when we're talking about civil laws, it's important to know the difference between slander and, and libel. Okay, so libel is, is written while slander is oral. Okay, so if you're going to slander somebody or you're going to talk bad about them or say something about that. Um, and when we say damages in this, it means a loss or injury suffered. Okay, so remember that. That's really important. So let's get into that. We talked about tort law. Now let's talk about contract law. So contract law touches our lives in many ways practically every single day. So contract law does not have to be formalized in writing to be binding. Uh, on the parties involved, and oral contracts are binding in many states and in most situations. So simply as a result of scheduling that first appointment in your practice, that patient and provider are now in an oral contract that requires the provider to care for the patient and for the patient to comply with the treatment protocols and of course payment for those services. So there's a different, couple different types of insurance uh, that will help cover you. So when a person is liable for an act, he or she is obligated or responsible according to law. This is why physicians carry liability insurance. So they carry those professional liability insurance, which is a third type of third party insurance to help guard them from liability costs. So medical assistants can also invest in liability insurance um, if you are doing some clinical uh, care aspects in your, in your training. So in order to make contracts valid, <coughs> two parties must have a mutual understanding and agreement on the intent of that contract. So manifestation is proven by an offer or an acceptance of that offer. So that's where that contract comes from, all right? The contract must involve legal subject matter, okay? So an obligation that requires an illegal action, such as a gambling contract, is not an enforceable contract. Uh, legal capacity of both parties. Now what I mean by this, legal capacity means that each party must be an adult of a sound mind or an emancipated minor. And then consideration, what I mean by consideration is an exchange of something of value, such as money um, or something along those lines for the physician's time. So all of these have to be met in order for that contract to be valid. Um, so after the provider and patient relationship has been established, the provider is obligated to attend the patient as long as, as, long as attention is required, unless the provider or the patient terminates that contract, okay? So the provider-patient relationship, like I said, is a contractual relationship that results in three steps. So step number one, the provider invites an offer by establishing availability. Okay, so having open um, availabilities in your scheduling book, you are accomplishing step number one. Step number two is patients accept an appointment and makes an offer by arriving for or requesting for treatment. So as soon as you know the patient calls and schedules an appointment and then shows up for that appointment, step number two is done. And then number three is the provider accepts the patient's offer by examining the patient and beginning treatment. Once that doctor or physician sees that patient, then you have started on um, step number three. So now that you're in this relationship, you're contractually required to treat that patient until your services are no longer needed. Okay. So if you do not do this, okay, if you breach your contract or you break what you're supposed to be doing, okay, that is called abandonment. Okay. So you protect the provider from abandonment. Um, so how do you protect the provider against a lawsuit for abandonment? And the details of the circumstance in which the provider is withdrawing from the case should be included in the patient's health record. So you need to really document why the physician is no longer treating that patient. And then you have to go through another formal process, which we'll talk about more, more so later on. We get to like mail uh, deliveries and we'll go from there. And another question I'm going to pose to you is when does a breach of contract occur? 
and that is if there is a failure to perform any term of the contract without a legitimate legal excuse, then you have a breach of contract. So when you are facing medical professional liability lawsuits, okay, this is what you guys will most generally be called to court for. Um, so it's important to know the, the vocabulary and the terms that go along with this. So this is really what we're going to focus on right now is just the terminology that goes on this. So even when the physician has made an error, often the level of tr trust between the physician and the patient determines whether a lawsuit is pursued. Now, the first step to building that trust starts with you guys as medical administrative assistants. You guys are the first ones that they see. You're the face of that, that medical office. Okay, they, they call to schedule an appointment with the physician. How you answer the phone and the way you treat them is going to help in defining the way they build trust in you. Same thing when they come in to check into their appointment. Um, if you are unprofessional and you're not doing the things the way you should be doing, you know, that building that trust isn't going to be there. If that trust isn't there, then a lot of times you will be stuck with those medical professional liability lawsuits. All right, so let's get on with the terminology. Some inter interrogatories, okay? And these are a list of questions from each party to the other in the lawsuit. And then you have the uh, dispositions, okay? And those are oral testimonies of a party or witness in a civil or criminal proceeding taken to trial. And then you have subpoenas, okay? Subpoenas are court issued. Uh, it's a document issued by a court that requires a person to be present at a specific time and place to testify as a witness in a lawsuit, all right? So medical li professional liability lawsuits are far from rare. So you really need to understand these terminology, this terminology and really grasp these concepts. All right, another term that you need to be uh, familiar with is uh, subpoena deuces to come, okay? Subpoena deuces to come, okay? And that is a court order to produce identified documents or records. This type of subpoena doesn't require that the person named in it be give, to give a testimony or a disposition of the trial. They just have to um, present different documents that have been identified. <clears throat> so inside the courtroom, here you have the plaintiff. And that is the person or the group of people that bring the court to, or the case to court. And then you have the defendant, which is the opposite party or the respondent, and they're the ones defending themselves. So burden of proof. Okay, this is what you need to, to, or the jury needs to have to make a guilty decision. So, and it, it differs from criminal cases to civil cases. Okay, so criminal cases must be proven, you must be proven guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. So... Any reasonable doubt, what is that? Well, reasonable doubt is defined as a level of certainty a juror must have to find the defendant guilty of a crime. It is a real, it is real doubt based on per, a reason or common sense after careful and impartial consideration of all evidence or lack of evidence in a case. All right, and then you have a civil case. And civil cases must be proven by a preponderance of the evidence. Now, this means that a greater weight of the evidence must point to the defendant or respondent as being responsible for the act involved in the case. It doesn't have to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. Um, so for a case that is proven beyond reasonable doubt, the scales, okay, so the link of a courtroom is two scales, okay? Innocent or guilty, okay? So for those cases of reasonable doubt, those scales really need to tip heavily one direction or the other, either guilty or innocent. However, for a case proven by preponderance of the evidence, in such as civil cases, um, the scales need to tip only slightly one way or the other. Um, and then you have the outcome of the case, and that's also known as the verdict, okay? It's either guilty or innocent, and, and that's known as the verdict. So the final decision of the trial court lies in the hands of the judge, okay? Just, just so we're aware of that. So let's talk about mediation and arbitration. Now, these are both uh, techniques to help avoid getting into court systems, um, and hopefully, you know, maybe your medical office and medical practice will look into some of these aspects, okay? So mediation is a third party that helps those involved in the dispute solve their own problems. So it's kind of nipping it in the bud, okay? You're not letting it get to court. So many providers and attorneys see mediation and arbitration as ways to solve crisis of litigation in this country, all right? So arbitration is an alternative to a trial in which a third party is chosen to hear evidence and to make a decision about the case. So arbitration is an alternative to trial in which the third party is chosen to hear evidence and make a decision about because of the individual's familiarity with or the knowledge of the law it, uh, of the issues involved. Arbitration usually is available to the medical profession, offering an alternative for resolving legal disputes between the patient and the physician. Arbitration applies essentially the same rights and same measure of damages as court. It is fair, it is legal, it is less expensive, 
it is faster, and it's more confidential than court litigation. So it really has a lot of benefits, and will, this is something that you guys really should um, look forward to, or look into. Um, you, you hear the arbitration a lot in um, the sports world. Anytime you have legal cases going forward, um, before it actually gets to court, it goes through an arbitration screening. So that just to make you aware. The staff of each medical office should know whether arbitration statutes exist in the state, um, where the office conducts, conducts business, and whether the state in which state medical board can verify that. An agreement is precisely worded by an attorney and should be met, should not be paraphrased, paraphrased when explained to a patient. So if a physician elects to implement an arbitration agreement procedure with the patients, every member of the physician staff should know the details of that agreement, how and when the patient should sign up, and how to answer the patient's questions. Let me get this out of here. Perfect. So, medical liability and negligence. Guys, these are really important slides. So, medical professional liability is commonly called medical malpractice. That's another name for it. So, the medical standard of care is considered the same type and level of care that is a reason that a reasonably competent healthcare professional in a similar field with similar training would have provided in the same situation. Okay? Negligence implies an inattention to one's duty or business. So, um, you know, if you fail to keep up to that medical standard that somebody with similar training and the same background and the same experience would have done, then you might see yourself in a medical malpractice case. Uh, so here are some different classifications of negligence, and these are really, really important. So let's first start off by um, defining what negligence is. So in medicine, negligence is defined as the performance of an act that a reasonable and prudent physician would not do or the failure to do an act that a reasonable and prudent physician would do. Okay, So although the medical assistant acts as an agent of that physician in carrying out most of their duties, the medical assistant may perform an act that could result in litigation. Um, so for example, if you, if you are a medical assistant that works in the clinical side as well, so uh, if the medical assistant gives the patient the wrong medication or the wrong dose of a medication, both the physician and the medical assistant could be held liable for that error. So it's really important to know. So let's get into the terminology here. You need to know the difference of these guys. It's really, really important. So malfeasance, mal, for Spanish-speaking people, okay? And, we, and you have a little bit of background in, Sp in Spanish. Mal means bad, okay? So bad is, is or wrong, okay? So wholly wrongful or an, unlaw an unlawful act. Misfeasance is that you're improperly doing a lawful act, all right? And nonfeasance is you're just not doing anything at all. Um, so you really need to know your scope of practice and then practice inside those scopes of practice. And we talked about your scope of practice earlier on in the assignment, so we should be familiar with that. So medical and administrative, and medical, clinical medical assistants are allowed to administer medication as long as it is included in their scope of practice for their state. Medical administrative assistants are not allowed to do any um, clinical aspects of medical assisting. So contributory negligence exists when the patient contributes to their own condition, and it can lessen the damages that can be collected or prevent them from being collected altogether if they contributed to that neglect. Now there's four D's that make up negligence, okay? and it's important to know these. So duty is the first one. So duty is that the patient has sought the assistance of the physician, and the physician has knowingly undertaken the provider, uh, undertaken to provide the needed medical service. So that is that patient-physician uh, relationship has been established. That's what duty is. Dereliction. Okay, dereliction is a failure to perform that duty. Okay, proof must exist that the physician somehow neglected the duty to the patient. And then you have direct cause, and this is proof that must exist that the patient was harmed directly because the physician's actions or failure to act and that the harm would not otherwise have occurred. And then damages is the patient must prove that a loss or a harm resulted from the physician's actions. Now there can be many different types of damages that could fall under that last category, okay? You can have nominal or punitive damages, and punitive damages were historically set so that amounts would discourage intentional wrongdoing, misconduct, and outrageous behavior. So the tort reform, currently a much discussed subject, would cap the amount of money that would be collected during personal injury litigation, including medical malpractice cases. So punitive damages are set to limited monetary values. All right, and then you have compensatory damages. And compensatory damages are meant to, be, to make the person whole again, to compensate for what they lost. Although it is impossible to compensate for something such as like a lost limb or something along those lines. Um, and then you have general damages, and general damages include compensation for pain and suffering, for loss of a bodily member or facility or disfigurement or other similar direct loss or injuries. 
And then you have special damages, and those include the loss of e uh, loss of earnings or loss of, or cost of travel. Both the fact of these losses and monetary values must be proven. So if they suffered from some way and they lost a job or something like that, that has to be proven um, that it was directly a cause of the physician's actions. So risk management practices. So first of all, let's talk about what risk management is. It's a combination of different approaches in the healthcare facility that reduce the likelihood that either an individual healthcare professional or healthcare facility will be sued. So it's kind of trying to take preventative measures in covering yourself. So the primary focus of your medical practice should be on the delivery of quality, safe patient care, but a secondary goal should be to avoid potential financial to avoid the potential financial consequences of a malpractice suit. And these are all ways to help prevent those. Okay, so you need adequately trained, you need to have adequately trained providers and staff. All right, that's why you guys going in as certified medical administrative assistants really help yourself out um, because they can, you can prove that you are certified and you prove that you're adequately trained in your field. Okay, you need to have open lines of communication. You need to have specific policies on how expired prescriptions can be refilled. You need to have policies on patient test results. You need to be able to track missed appointments. Um, communication issues with patients need to be um, documented and established and then make sure the facility is safe for patient use and then of course you need to follow all documentation procedures <coughs> so m there are different types of insurances that can cover you from all of these uh, lawsuits that you could be facing so those are liability medical malpractice and personal injury insurance so individual prior providers and healthcare facilities typically purchase several different types of insurances to cover themselves so liability insurance protects the healthcare facility if there's an accident in the facility. While medical malpractice insurance protects the provider and or other, the healthcare facility if there is a judgment against, the medical, uh, against them for medical negligence, malfeasance, or malpractice. So, and then you have personal injury insurance and that covers both bodily harm and non-physical, non-economic harm. So now we got to get into consent. Now this is an important one. This is really important. You'll have a lot of questions about this on your CMA que uh, exam. Now you might have like two or three on this. So it's really important to know this. Um, so consent. In order to give consent, the person has to be medically or uh, mentally competent. That means they can understand the situation and, and can give consent to it. All right. Consent is invalid if a person is unauthorized or it's maintained by fraud. So if the act being consented upon is unlawful, consent is invalid. Okay, so if you're doing, if you're, if they're consenting to something illegal, it doesn't matter. Okay, now the provider must have consent to treat a patient. That's legal. Okay, you have to have consent to treat a patient. We'll talk about consent, uh, implied consent or informed consent in the future here. Okay, um, so in, implied consent is given in the case of an emergency. All right, so let's say you're driving in your car. All right, and you drive up upon a, a car crash. All right, that is an emergency situation. There is imminent danger. Okay, so consent is consent is implied. So in an emergency, one may render aid or care to prevent loss of life, serious illness or injury, or serious illness or injury. However, implied consent in the circumstance only lasts as long as the emergency exists. So if you handle that situation, you remove them um, from say this vehicle and they are no more in immediate danger they're not bleeding out or lost losing consciousness or anything like that okay that is when you have to now obtain consent formal consent can be given as soon as the emergency has passed physicians sometimes are reluctant to render aid in an emergency to someone who is not their patient for fear that they will be charged for negligence or abandonment all right however the good samaritan law um, kind of helps protect them from that so under this law, volunteers at a scene of an accident are given immunity to liability for any civil damages resulting from the rendering of emergency care. Most states now have Good Samaritan or uh, Volunteer Protection statutes. Okay, um, only provide emergency care though for which you are trained. So for you guys, that's CPR, first aid, and AED. Okay, so um, just remember that for minors, consent must be obtained from the parent guardian or guardian ad litem, except in an emergency requiring treatment, just as we talked about before. So here we go, let's get into informed consent. That was all implied consent. Now informed consent is what you must get for medical procedures, all right? So the discussion needs to happen, be fully documented in the patient's health record, and a copy must be signed, uh, and a copy of the signed form should be placed in the record. 
So patients cannot be forced to undergo any type of medical treatment or care. They have that right to make that decision. <coughs> Each state has its own consent laws, so you need to be familiar with whatever state you're working in and what is expected of you. So Medicaid sometimes requires a 30-day waiting period, for example, between the signing of the consent for tubular litigation and the performance of that procedure. So these are the things that need to happen in order to, for an informed consent to be legal. Okay, the patient's diagnosis, if it's known, has to be presented. What, what is wrong? Okay, what is going on with this patient? From there, you have to give the nature of, and purpose of the proposed treatment or procedure. Okay, so this is the diagnosis. Now, this is what I want to do to treat you. This is what I would like to do. This is how I'd like to do it. The risks and benefits of the proposed treatment and procedure. So, now that I've proposed this treatment and procedure to you, these are the benefits. These are the risks that go along with that procedure. And then we have to show the same thing with alternative treatment, alternative treatments or procedures, their risks and benefits. And then, of course, the risks and benefits of having no procedure at all. And then that patient gets to make the decision based upon your medical advice. So say a, consent, a, a minor is, needs to give consent for a surgery. Who gives that? And that is going to the, be the, the, uh, the guardian ad litem, wh whoever is the patient's or that minor's legal guardian. Now, the statute of limitations, okay? Statute of limitations is a period after which a lawsuit can be filed, and it varies from state to state by litigation type, okay? The statute of limitations for medical malpractice issues varies from state to state, ranging from one to five years. However, in some instances, the state of limitations can be extended um, because of the delay in the discovery of an injury. So many statute of, or the statute of limitations starts after the discovery of the injury or illness, okay? not when they got sick or injured, at the discovery. There is, there is a difference. So confidentiality. This is probably you know, something you're going to hear over and over and over again through these lectures, so uh, get used to hearing these words. Uh, so if you breach confidentiality, it is grounds for immediate dismissal from your position and job. So it's important to use strict care when dealing with patient records and discovering inf uh, discussing information about those patients. Now, let's talk a little bit more about th reporting things, okay? So a patient who tests positive for HIV may face discrimination if the information surfaces due to a lack of confidentiality. Physicians who treat such patients may want to take extra care when leaving for, uh, phone messages or sending mail to that patient. <coughs> Excuse me. Confidentiality is also the utmost importance of patients receiving treatment for mental health issues, sexually transmitted diseases, sexual assault, or any type of abuse. Um, however, you'd still have to report some things. Okay? And you, as a medical assistant, may be responsible for reporting those. Um, and those are things like births and deaths, or suspicious deaths, STDs, child abuse, or any other reportable diseases. Now, physicians must also report cases that may result from violence, such as gunshot wounds or knife injuries or poisonings, okay? Individuals with cases of AIDS must be reported to the local health department. A continuing controversy exists as to whether the reporting prompts patients to receive care or deters individuals in high-risk groups from seeking care. Child abuse, okay? Let's talk about child abuse real quick. It is the leading cause of death in children five years or younger, so that's why suspected cases must be reported. Um, visit your local health department for information about, re about reporting protocols to know the proper steps on how to go about this. So now, in the next couple slides here, we're going to try to end up here pretty shortly. We're going to talk about the, the legal statutes put out from the national government signed by Congress. All right? And the first one is the Patient Self-Determination Act. So basically, this requires healthcare facilities to ensure patients um, that they will receive information about living wills, power of attorneys, and advanced directives. So these documents place a decision-making power in the hands of the patients and their families, providing them with written notification of their rights to consent or for the refusal of medical treatment. The next one is the Uniform Anatomical Gifts Act. <clears throat> and this was developed to make sure that all states have the same laws about organ donation. All right? The most important clause of the act permits that donations must be made in written or by a, uh, or by a witnessed document. Okay, and those documents, as you'll see, okay, this card in the next slide, it takes two witnesses to sign that. So, provision, um, the uniform donor card is considered legal in all 50 different states, and the next slide you will actually see that owner do donor card. So, provisions of the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act are designed so that donations occur only after death. Obviously, you don't want to donate your organs or body parts while you're still alive, and no money can be exchanged in this donation. 
Okay, so that's important to, to know. So here's an example of that organ donation donation card. Um, it basically just says, I, Blink, have spoken to my family about organ, donation, organ and tissue donation, and I wish to donate any of the needed organs or all of the following different organs, and then here are your two witnesses that must sign that. So the patient's bill of rights. Now, guys, this is an important one. You'll hear about this a ton, okay? So the patient's bill of rights, and if you want to look on page 79 in your textbook, um, in big greenish, bluish box right in the center of it, those are the patient bill of rights. You need to know the eight sections, okay? So the patient bill of rights provides consumers with credible and effective mechanisms to addressing their concerns and encourages consumers to take an active role in improving and ensuring their health. Okay, so like I said, there's eight sections that list three goals, and here are the three main goals. Uh, it's to strengthen consumer confidence by ensuring the healthcare system is fair and responsive. You want to reinform the importance of a strong physician-patient relationship and reform consumers' critical role in their care. So if you look at, like I said, on page 79, you'll see all of the um, patient bill of rights there, but below it, you'll see procedure 6.1 that says applying those patient bill of rights to and choice in treatment um, choice of treatment, consent of treatment, and refusal of treatment. So really look at both of those things and, and make yourself and educate yourself on them. The next one is the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the ADA, as it's, as it's known, was signed into law in 1990. And its goal was to eliminate discrimination against individuals who have disabilities. All right, individuals with disabilities must be able to enter and exit facility without any difficulty. And then individuals who uh, must be able to navigate throughout the facility without any major barriers as well. So example, you know, you must have ramps entering into the building. You must have handi and handicapped accessible water fountains. If there's a second floor in your building, you must provide an elevator. Those types of things. So in 2008, Congress passed the ADA amendments, which is also known as the ADAA Act, um, to broaden the definition of a disability. Okay, the GINA Act, okay, or the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and GINA was signed into law in 2008, so it's new, fairly new. Um, it prohibits discrimination in health coverage and employment based in genetic information. Individuals cannot be denied health insurance, and employers must make and employers make job-related decisions based on the individual's genetic history. So many states already have laws that protect against genetic discrimination in health insurance and employment situations. However, the degree of protection varies widely, so it's important to know that. All entities subject to GINA must, at a minimum, comply with all the acceptable or applicable, sorry, GINA requirements, and they may also need to comply with all applicable uh, protective state laws. HIPAA. We'll talk about HIPAA a ton. It's important to know what it is. HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. You might want to write that down. You'll hear it a lot. Okay? Its goals are to limit administrative costs of healthcare and privacy issues, to prevent fraud and abuse, and to provide security and confidentiality guarantees for the patients. Now, there are two main provisions that make up HIPAA. There's Title I and Title II. Title I is the insurance reform, while Title II is the administrative simplification. So the use of electronic transmissions lower administrative costs, but it makes it harder to keep health information private. So the law provides security and confidentiality guarantees for that patient. An extensive privacy rule has been added in recent years, um, and we'll get into that as well. So that notice of privacy practices, if you want to flip to your book to page 82, okay, you will see a HIPAA patient, a patient HIPAA acknowledgement, okay, and this requires HIPAA notice of privacy practices requires healthcare providers to distribute a notice that provides a clear, user-friendly explanation of the individual personal health information rights. So you need to educate your patient about the rights when they come into your office. This is a paper that a new patient will fill out when they come into your clinic. Um, so the law requires that the patient sign the statement acknowledging they have received the notice of privacy practices. That's what's on page 82. That is um, the notice of privacy practices statement. All right. And basically it defines how covered entities use individually identifiable health information, also known as personal health information or PHI. Um, the privacy rule allows covered entities to disclose PHI to public health authorities when required by federal, tribal, or state local laws. Um, if you look on the next page, you have some defi uh, definitions of HIPAA terms. So it's important to look through those, educate yourselves about what they're talking about with all these HIPAA laws and regulations. The HIPAA security rule. This covers the use of trans and transmission of electronic uh, protected health information, or ePHI. 
okay? Covered entities must also have in place procedures for attaining EPHI during an emergency for healthcare employees with the authority to access that information. Now there's different safeguards that, you, that come with a security rule. There's administrative safeguards, physical safeguards, and technical safeguards. So with HIPAA, anybody can file a health information privacy complaint through the complaint portal at the offices of civil rights at your DHHS. Uh, so if anybody has a complaint about uh, a breach in confidentiality or something along those lines, they can make complaints. So all healthcare providers, clearing houses, and health plans that use electronic information must comply with HIPAA regulations. And there are many benefits to complying with HIPAA. And here are just some of them. Um, th it'll lower your administrative costs. It'll increase your data accuracy. It'll increase your customer, consumer and patient satisfaction. You'll reduce revenue cycle time and you'll improve your financial management. So if you look on page 84, um, you will see procedure 6.2 that says applying HIPAA rules on privacy release of information and reporting illegal activity in the healthcare setting. Okay, look at that. Understand the ways to go about that and, and practice that on your own if you would like. We're almost done here, guys. I promise you. Uh, the High Tech Act. <clears throat> the High Tech Act was signed into law in 2009, and High Tech is an acronym for Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health. So it promotes the adoption of meaningful use in health information technology. Physicians who do not adopt electronic medical records will be penalized in Medicare payments. So the law encourage. That's that's how the law encourages uh, compliance with the HIPAA regulations by enacting those stiff penalties uh, for non-compliance. Patients must be notified whenever there is a breach of confidentiality that exposes the patient's protected health information. <clears throat> so civil penalties uh, that, that we are talking about here can range from anywhere from like $250,000 with repeated violations costing you up to $1.5 million. So um, like I said, data breach notifications are required and it also requires that DHHS conduct a period, a period, periodic audits of covered entities and business associates. And then we have the Affordable Care Act of 2010, and this was designed to provide better health security by enacting comprehensive health insurance reforms that hold insurance companies accountable, lowering health care costs, guaranteeing more choices, and enhancing the quality of care for all Americans. Okay? Health insurers and employers are required to provide clear and consistent information about health plans. Now, if you look on, let me get it here, um, on page 86, halfway down on the left-hand side column, you will see this, this uh, chart, and it says health care changes resulting from the Affordable Care Act, and these benefits have taken place over the past five years, so it's important to know those. So in closing, okay, I know I threw a lot at you. This was a long presentation. Thank you for sticking with me, uh, but it's important to kind of bring it all together. So in closing, and patient, closing comments and patient education, don't be skeptical when it comes to laws, okay? You as medical assistants can prevent claims, so if you follow the laws and the regulations that are set forth by you and, and do your job correctly, you know, you will prevent these uh, court claims that will come against, against you and your, your medical practice. Um, practice patience because regulations do change. Um, they change all the time. As, you, as we just talked about, we, ha we saw many new laws that were put into place since like 2008. So it's really important to um, practice patience and take these regulation changes as they come. Stay calm and answer all questions the best that you can. Um, many medical forms can be very complicated and patients may need help in understanding everything. So that's where you need to just relax, stay calm, explain it all to them because you know patient-centered care is the main focus here. And then legal and ethical issues. Physicians may be held responsible for mistakes of those who work in their healthcare facility, and sometimes they must pay for damages for neglect acts of their employees. So under the doctrine of respondent superior, that's what that fa falls under. Physicians are legally responsible to act uh, for the acts of their employees when they are acting within the scope of their duties or employment and acts of assistance who are not their own employees if they commit acts of negligence. So if you, as a medical assistant, commit an act of negligence, your physician will suffer those consequences as well. So even assistants with no money can be held liable for any neglect actions. And liens can be placed on property in anticipation for sale and potential profit. So even if you don't have the money uh, and you act in a neglectful way, um, you will still be responsible for all that. 
All right, if you have any questions, guys, please feel free to ask me. Um, again, nice job getting through this presentation. Really pay attention to this stuff because it was difficult, but it is really, really important to know this stuff. Um, you know, have fun, keep pushing forward. Nice job, guys.